the reason why this gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Zach is because as far as I know, I don't think he's actually ever done any Flat Earth presentation. Um, so I think the uniqueness of it is the thing that I'm really looking forward to. So I'm not too sure where he is at this moment. Hopefully he's very, very close. But Zach, can you just make sure you're okay technically or whatever you're going to be, you know, just be at your podium. But could you please give a warm welcome to Zach? <laughs> 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 I would suggest that if you can clap and cheer loudly along the way, I think he'd really appreciate it. Oh, oh man. Right, you don't need this. I don't know, I don't need that. All right. Um, hi, Flat Earthers. <laughs> just, just to break the ice. Uh, um, anyway, I think Gary, Gary did a big mistake when he brought me here. But anyway, uh, I got only knows how this is going to look like, but... Anyway, um, I'm going to cut right to the chase. I'm going to tell you why I'm here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk about the biggest problem of the flat earth. Yes, I'm going to attack the flat earth this time. What are you going to do about it? Hmm? <laughs> you know, the reason why I want to do this is because uh, not too many people know about these problems. And I know that if you want to solve a problem, you have to face it. Because if you run away from it, you will never be able to solve it. And the problem will remain in the same place. So whenever you take a step forward, it will pull you back to your place. The problem itself is talking to you. It's telling you, you cannot do, you cannot go any further without solving me. So what is the biggest problem of the flat earth? If you want me to put it into one word, I will say angles. Anybody who really investigated the flat earth have come to this and they all found it as a big wall. None of them could go through it. None of them. But if you are a fighter like me, <laughs> you will keep digging and digging until you make a little hole in that wall and then you will finally be able to go through it. What I'm going to show you right now um, is how to draw this globe earth model from scratch. Because if you know how to draw this from scratch, you will know how to draw this from scratch. You will face the same problems as they faced before. So you have to know how they made this globe earth model from scratch so you can understand how to do this flat earth model from scratch because there is no flat earth model. And if you think there is a flat earth model, you don't understand this, the angles, <clears throat> all right? So I wanna take you back to the life of the first humans on earth. Oh, these are just a bunch of naked people. So, oh. All right, <laughs> I want you to imagine yourself in a, you know, in a, in a place where everyone around you is trying to understand the universe that circles around us like a clock. All right? The first thing you might want to do to understand the universe is to create time. All right? I mean, if you are a smart human being, you have to start with time. Because time is everything. You don't have time. We are talking about, you know, you are 2,000 years earlier. <laughs> anyway, so... The best thing, the best light you would start with is the sun because it's the most powerful light you know, the, the most powerful light you see, so why not? So what are you going to do with the lights of the sun? You're going you're gonna, to, you know, you're going to place a stick perpendicular to the ground, all right? And then you measure the shadows and then you, re you will realize that the shadows draw, uh, draw half circles, different half circles throughout the year, all right? The sun travels, I mean, it goes it goes farther away and it comes back later, all right? The weather changes as it moves. The oceans change as the moon moves. Then you start to think about seasons. Then you realize that you need something to navigate, so you create a compass. And then you realize that every other light in the sky is connected, so you create something called the astrolabe to measure the angles of every light in the sky at the same time. So. You get smarter and smarter until you finally create something called the signs of the zodiac. You know, believing that the magnetic energy of these stars can affect the human's personality. And most people see it as a stupidity, but if you think about it, if you think about it, even lights, even colors, even colors can change the human's personality. The sounds and the voices you hear, the movements you see, the people around you, the, the buildings you live in, even your name, anything can change your personality. So imagine what a big magnetic energy that moves the oceans can do to you. But anyway, this is not our subject. I'm just going to put it aside. Just wanted to pay your attention to how human beings connected the, the sky to earth. But anyway, so as you got smarter now, 
you would want to do something. You would want to know the shape of the place you live on, right? So here is the problem. You only have a tape measure, a shadow, and probably your brain. What are you going to do with these things? Can anybody tell me? This is all you have. What are you going to do with them? How are you going to know the shape of the earth and you only have three things? All right. At that time, at that time, you only, um, you, you probably believe that the earth is flat because that's what you see. All right. So the first thing you might want to do to understand the universe is to measure the distances between us, between us and those lights in the sky. And how are you going to do that? You're going to need at least two sticks. All right. So you're going to put them far away from each other. All right. As far as possible, because the, the sun is obviously big. All right. So imagine the distance between uh, these two, uh, uh, these two sticks is 2,074 miles, and the angles of elevation is 75 degrees in both sides. Then the distance to the sun has to be 3,870 miles, and that's the math behind it. All right. That's the math behind it. It's so simple. So if you do this, you would want to tell everybody about it, right? But well, you're going to have a lot of trolls around you, and they will ask you. They will want to do the same thing. And here, is, here comes the, the next problem. Everybody is going, to, is going to do the same thing. They will find different distances to the sun. Somebody's going to find the distance to the sun is 3,000 miles. And you, somebody else will find it 2,000 miles. So you will want to do this, the experiments again, but in a different way. So check out this diagram. So what you see here is land. This is actually land, all right? And, and this is the sun. We don't know where it is. So it can be anywhere. And these are the angles of the light during uh, the daylight, 12 hours of the day, or in this case, 10 hours. Uh, so anyway, if you are right here and your friend is right here, both, both angles are 75 degrees, then the distance to the sun has to be, like I said before, 3,870 3, uh, miles. So now... If you have, if you want to do the same thing, what, sorry, <laughs> if you want to do the same thing with many people, uh, from different places on earth, at the same time, uh, and imagine you have this guy right here, he's gonna triangulate the sun from, from, with this guy right here. So they, have, they will have the sun at an al uh, altitude, uh, that is, um, I cannot even see it from here, but anyway, it's gonna be lower than the first one. And the guy right here is gonna have the, uh, the sun at, at, at uh, even lower altitude. So, and the guy who's not even here on the screen, he's going to see the sun right above the guy who is right here, right above his head. And he's going to call him on, on a cell phone, Eratosthenes' cell phone. Because, you know, Eratosthenes at that time had a cell phone. So, so he's going to call him, hey, man, uh, I see the sun right above your head, so the distance to the sun has to be zero, right? Oh, the guy, <laughs> the guy right over, right over here is going to be like, no, man, you must have confused me with somebody else. The sun is way above me, my head. I'm, so you as a geometry guy, and I say geometry guy because they all, all they know is what they have on the paper. They don't know what's going on in the universe. So as a geometry guy, how is this possible on a flat earth? If you believe on a flat earth, this is not possible. You cannot have too many suns. You only have one sun. So how are you going to solve this? Can anybody tell me how you are going to solve this problem? Because this is a really big problem for flat earthers. Tell me. It's an apparent position, the sun. The sun is in what? It's an apparent position, like a personal frame of reference. All right. So how are you going to solve these, pro these angles? All these angles have to go to one point. Because if you are in a hallway, if you are in a hallway, and you, you put a bulb, for example, right here in the middle, all right, and you go somewhere, and you measure the angle of elevation of that ball, you will get a distance to that, to that, to that lamp, all right? So if you go farther away and you do the same thing, you will, you will get the same exact distance to that ball. This is how, this is how it works. But in this case, it doesn't work like that. Something is wrong with this. These are real angles taken from real life. I'm, I'm, I didn't make them up. You know, if you measure yourself, you're going to find the same exact angle. So you're going to have three options. There is no four options. You're going to have three options as a geometry guy. The first option is keep it flat and do something in the sky, which is not the case. Because if you look up in real life, you're not going to see anything, just clouds. So you're going to dismiss this. And then you will go to the second option, which is curve down the earth. So these are, let's say these are the real elevation angles, all right? When you curve down the earth, you can see that the, 
elevation angles, they diverge from the top. And eventually, they will become parallel to each other. And in this case, we will have one sun. Because all these lines, they will never meet. They will, they will never intersect anywhere because they are parallel to each other. But if we claim that the sun is too big, then maybe, you know? So in this case, may, you can say that we are, try, we, are, we are solving the problem. But if, if, you, I mean, if you rely on these uh, two pictures, then you have too many suns. You cannot solve it that way. And the third option is concave. So if you curve the Earth up like this, you will have a bigger problem than the flat Earth. And this is a message for concave Earthers. If you think that the Earth is concave, then you have to solve this problem. And I know that you don't know what I mean by, that, by this, but if you continue watching, then you will know. So you go back to your globe, and you look at it. And you look at it again because you don't understand. I mean, you have, you're not solving anything here. So what do you want to do now to, to solve this problem? The first thing you will, you will think about is measure the distance between these lines and make it, uh, make it match with reality. You have to make it match reality. So how are you going to do this? There is somebody very smart. We all know him called Eratosthenes, a guy with a cell phone. Here he, here he is, so smart. This guy, this guy measured the circumference of the Earth. So when you measure the circumference of the Earth, of course you will know the distance between these two lines. So how did he do that? You all know the story of Herosasthenes, or should I repeat it? You all know it, right? Okay, good. So um, anyway, before being as smart as Herosasthenes, you have to go through some geometry lessons. I don't know if everybody here knows uh, geometry, but if you don't, then I'm going to, I'm just going to show you something really small here. I mean, it's not, it's not a big problem. So before being as smart as Eritasenes, you're going to take a globe like this or a circle, or you're going to divide it into 24 parts. Some of you will ask me why 24 and not 27 or 200 miles, uh, 200 <laughs> pieces. Uh, the reason, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. They just, uh, I mean, 24 parts means 24 hours. Okay. So, um, so when you divide it into 24 hours, uh, I don't know. I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> I got nervous here. <laughs> I got to admit. <laughs> anyway, so 24 hours is just, uh, let's say, it's like when you say the circle is 360 degrees, okay? It can be anything. For example, this protractor right here is 400 degrees. So it's just a unit. Even if when you change the number, the circle is still the same. It didn't get bigger or smaller. You don't, change, you don't change anything when you change the number. So it's just the unit. Just like when you say one mile equal 1.6 kilometers. The distance is still the same. The number has changed. We're just playing the, a game here. So they, they chose 24 hours for some reason. I don't know it. So when you divide the circle into 24 hours, you get 15 degrees in each angle. All right? So 15 degrees is a, is a good number. So when you know this, you have to do something else. You're going to draw a line from the center to the, to the sun, all right? So that, that line is going to take you directly to the sun, right? So if you want to measure the angle of the sun, it's going to be 90 degrees. It doesn't matter the shape. I mean, it doesn't matter the size of the, the ball. It doesn't matter how big it is. So if you go to the next angle right there and you draw a parallel line to the first one, you're going to get 75 degrees in all scales. And I don't know why, because this is how the ball works. So in fact, this, these are three, four balls, all right? All these angles measure the same, as long as you are drawing parallel lines, okay? They measure the same. The first one is 75 degrees. The second ball is 75 degrees too. So they all work the same way. It doesn't matter the size of the ball. This is really important. So, so here is the, so Eratosthenes wants to know the real distance from my, for example, let's say I am here and the distance to this, I mean, the, the angle of elevation is 90 degrees, okay? And somebody is somewhere, his angle is 75 degrees. If we measure the distance between us, it has to match our model. So our model has to match the reality. I mean, if it doesn't, if it doesn't match, then our ball is is not reality, so we have to, to create another model. So, Eratosthenes was here, all right, in Alexandria, and he sent his friend to Syene. His friend is named uh, Mykines. 
Well, I just made it up. But because, you know, all those names, you know, you just have to add a knees at the end, and that's it. Mike and knees, Karen knees, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's all. <laughs> anyway, so that guy, uh, that guy had the sun as 90 degrees over the wall, all right? So they measured the distance between, between them. It was 500 miles. And the, the angle of Eratosthenes was 7.2 degrees, and I call it the angle of deception because it's not the angle of elevation, but it's almost the same thing. So what he did was divide 360 degrees by 7.2, and he multiplied it by the distance, and he got 25,000 miles in circumference. Very nice. Very close to our, our circumference, 24,901 miles. So if you look at this information... What do you understand? Nothing, right? Does anybody understand anything? I mean, if you tell me. Well, they basically presuppose the Earth was a globe based on how the sun lines up in relation to the Good. position on the Earth. Great. So, what are you going to do with this information? Imagine you are you are a friend of Eratosthenes, and he gave you this. You're going to look at it, and you will be like, "What the hell is that?" I mean, all I see is a bunch of lines in a circle. I mean, it doesn't make any. Tell me. I, I didn't hear you, I swear to God. <laughs> ah, big sun. Yeah, well, the size of the sun doesn't... This, yeah, but the, sun, the size of the sun doesn't matter. I'm gonna, I will explain it later. I'll, yeah, all right, so I'll explain it later. All right, so if you give this to anybody on Earth, they will look at it and they will be like, okay... Uh, I mean, only astronomers will use these angles. I mean, nobody uses angles. Who uses angles? Astronomers and a bunch of other crazy people. That's it. I mean, that's it. What are you going to do with this? Nothing. I mean, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, so you will look at it and you will be like, mm, mm, this is nothing. But I see, I see everything here. This is reality. This is the world we are living in. I see the future. I see everything here. So the first thing I will want to do with these numbers is draw the, the, the map, everybody's going to use the map. The map is the future. If you don't have a map, you have nothing. So at that time, you don't have a map, so you're going to need a map, right? I can draw the map using these numbers. Can anybody tell me how? All right, so anyway, imagine this. Imagine I am this guy, okay? I, I'm standing right here, and this is a big paper, and the sun is right above me, all right? And we're going to stop the time. The sun is not going to move. It's going to stay there all the time. So I'm going to be here, and I got a friend, and I got a friend beside me. I'm going to tell him to blindfold me. His name is Mike Kavanaugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell him to blindfold me, all right, and just keep walking in any direction because I don't want to see him, all right? He's going to keep walking and walking and walking, and then he's going to stop somewhere far away from me, very far away from me. And then he will call me on Eratosthenes' cell phone, we have to use the Sassanese cell phone, by the way, because if we don't do that, we have to, net, to wait for next year, and next year is going to take us a lifetime. Now, as, long as, ha- as long as we have a Sassanese cell phone, then it's okay. So Mike is going to go to that direction. He's, he walks kind of like this, and, and then he's going to stop somewhere. <laughs> he's going to stop somewhere, and he's going to pick up his phone. He's going to call me, hey, Zach, I'm here. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> He will, he will ask me, I will, I will ask him, you know, uh, what is your angle of elevation? Er, uh, Mike is going to measure his angle of elevation. He's going to be like, you know, uh, I think my angle of elevation is 75 degrees. I go back to my position. All right, so 75 degrees. I'm going to come um, to my drawing. You can use this one or this one. It doesn't matter. It's the same. So 75 degrees, Mike is right here. All right, so I'm going to know that the distance between us is 1,037 miles. That's the distance between me and Mike. I just knew it by using the angles, because these, these are our real angles. So I'm, I already know, by just simple math, I know the distance to, to Mike. And I'm going to confirm it, because Mike already measured the distance while he was going there. So Mike will be like, mm, what is the, the distance to, to me? And I'm going to be like, 1,037. It's going to be, oh, man, I just missed 1,036. How did you know that? Man, I got a break. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> yeah, you wanted to make fun of me? There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, 
So the distance between us is 1,037 miles. Do I know where... I'm going to ask him uh, about the place, of course. Where are you, Mike? Mike is going to be like, he's going to be like, I'm in Egypt. Okay. So I know the distance to Egypt. Do I know what Egypt is? No. no. That's correct. I don't know what Egypt is. I just know the distance to Egypt. So if I want to know what Egypt is, I'm going to know, I'm going to need another angle. What is it? The angle of azimuth, the horizontal angle. I didn't use it yet. So we only used the elevation angles, and the elevation angles can only tell me the distance to that guy. That's it. And I, I want to know the, the, I mean, I want to triangulate that guy. So I'm going to need another angle, which is horizontal. So how the hell am I supposed to do that? I'm going to call Mike again. Hey, Mike, do you have a, a compass? Who the hell is a compass? No, you don't have it. Forget about it. Uh, uh, <laughs> do you have a protractor? Of course I have a protractor. All right. Is it a big, ass, is it a big protractor or what? Yeah, it's a big ass protractor. Okay, Mike, you, gotta, you have to stand on it. So Mike is going to stand on that protractor. It's a big protractor. I'm going to tell him, Mike, you have to point zero degrees to Polaris. Do you know where Polaris is? Do you know what it is? Oh, of course I know, man. I'm an astronomer. You forgot it. All right. So you're going to point zero degrees to Polaris. I'm going to do the same thing for my position. I'm going to point Polaris. I'm going to point zero degrees to Polaris. All right. Just like in this uh, drawing. Look at number one, for example. I have Polaris right here, but it should be somewhere else. You know, it should be uh, th the line that goes to Polaris should be parallel to the other one. I just did it like this so you guys can see it. But anyway, you're gonna, I'm, I'm, he's going to point his protractor to Polaris, and I'm going to point my protractor to Polaris. And I'm going to draw a circle with the radius of 1,037 miles, which is the distance between us. Now, now Mike can be anywhere on that circle. He can be anywhere. He can be right there, right behind me. He can be anywhere. So if I want to know where Mike is, I'm going to try to move that protractor around that circle. I'm just going to move it like this. Point in zero degrees to Polaris all the time, all right? And I'm going to draw a line from his feet to... No, first I'm going to ask Mike... Yeah, I forgot this. First, come, first I'm going to ask Mike to tell me where the sun is, because the sun is right above my head, okay? So, the, so Mike is going to be like, uh, well, um, the, uh, I don't know how to measure that. And I'm, I'm going to show him how to measure the distance, I mean, uh, the, 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 the azimuth of the sun. So Mike is going to be like one, two, three, four, ninety degrees, three, blah, 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 180 degrees, blah, 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 270 degrees. So the angle of azimuth of the sun for Mike is 270 degrees, all right? So I'm going to draw a line from his feet to 270 degrees. I'm going to keep doing this, like just like in the picture. That line is not going to go through me, and I want it to go through me. Because there is only one point on that circle where, where that line is going to go through me. So I'm going to keep moving that protractor around that circle. And eventually that circle, I mean, that line is going to go through me. That's where Mike is. There is no other point. Mike is going to be there for sure. So I'm going to know that Mike is right there. If I walk that way, I will find Mike. Maybe I will be a few miles off. I don't know, but... Mike has to be right there. Now I know where Egypt is, and I know where Mike is. All right? So the same thing, I, I, I mean, the way I found Egypt, I can find Morocco. I can find any other place that is close to me. So this is how I can map the world. If this line right here is parallel to this line, then I'm going to draw the UTM grid system. That's what I'm going to draw. And then I'm going to wrap, wrap it around a globe. All right? But... Uh, uh, do you find this interesting, guys? Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so uh, now you know where Egypt is, and you can draw the, the entire map, especially the countries that are around you. All right, so is this, is this all? You will find another problem. The problem is, if you want to draw other countries like, let's say, UK, all right, let, let, me, let me say, I want to triangulate London, all right? So I'm going to send somebody. London in my, you know, if my calculations is right in front of me. So I'm going to send somebody there. It's not going to find London there. You know, I'm going to be asking myself, how can I find Egypt and Morocco and all countries are close 
and I could not find London in the right position. That guy is going to go left, he's going to find London, but the distance between us is still the same. Yo, what, what's going on? I mean, if, if London is right there, and I'm telling you this because I did it before. London is right there, and we have, let's say, a distance like 5,000 miles. I, I don't, I'm not even sure. So if that guy goes left, the distance is still the same, but London is here, it's not here. So there is something wrong with the azimuth because the angles of elevation are working because the distance is working. But the direction to where London is is not working. So what, what am I supposed to do? How the hell am I supposed to solve this? We have to find a solution. So as a globe earther, you, we have messed with the... No, sorry. Uh, when we did this, we messed with the angles of elevation. All right? We mess with the earth. We curve down the earth in order to fix these angles to make them look parallel to each other. All right? And that's how we fix these distances. So if we want to make the, uh, the azimuth work, we have to mess with something else. So what are you going to do in this case? And this is just my theory. I think they tilted the earth 23.4 degrees to get to north. And this is how you can, can make the azimuth work and finish the glow. Of course, the first map is going to look like a mess. You have to adjust it and just and adjust it until you finish it, right? So uh, this is how they draw the entire map. And once you draw the map, what are you going to do next? You still have problems. And these are all the problems of the flat earth, all right? If you are a flat earther, you have to focus on these angles. Because if you know how to deal with angles, the way they, they draw the, the ball earth map, you can draw the flat earth map. But it's not going to be easy. They tilted the earth. You have to do something to the earth. Because I already solved the problem of these elevation angles. And I couldn't solve the problem of the azimuth. Not because it's impossible. It's because I, I couldn't do it yet. I'm still trying. So, so once you draw the ball earth ma map, you're going to have another problem. This is the, the next problem. Uh, this is what I was going to tell you. How many people think that this is correct? Nobody. How many of you think that this is correct? Good, everybody. Because this is the truth. They, they, this is the truth. They know it. They know that the sun, I mean, the angles of elevation come from the center. They know it. Don't think that they don't know it. All right? And this is why they put the sun so far away. It doesn't matter the size. See the size right here? They deal with the sun as one point. They, they, they just care about the center of the sun. All right? They only need the size when it comes to the eclipse. But when it comes to angles, they only deal with the, with the sun as one point. Because the size of the sun can be determined while you have the distance. If you have the distance, you have the size. If you have the size, you have the distance. That's it. If you modify, if you modify the distance, you have to modify the size. This is how it works. So if you put the sun right here, look at these angles. They don't look parallel to each other. But when you put it far away, they start to become almost parallel. So they put the sun 3,093 million miles away. So of course they will look parallel. They come, if you, if you draw lines from 93 million miles away from the center of the earth, from the center of the sun, and make it so small, it doesn't matter the size. You're gonna, you're gonna bring those lines from the center, just like this, and you bring them to earth, these lines will look parallel to each other. That's why I told you the size doesn't matter. You know? So, this is how you fix the problem of the angles. You have them parallel to each other, and at the same time, they are intersecting somewhere. Because <laughs> they will just look parallel from Earth, but they are not. So this is how they solve this problem. One sun, one Earth. And the angles are working. Isn't this genius? It's a globe model, I know it. And I'm a flat earther, but this is, this is genius. They fix everything. They fix the azimuth and the, the elevation angles and everything. Yeah, of course. There are par the, exactly. Well, they, they are. They don't say they are parallel 100%. If you if you look at it, uh, look it up, they say they are close to parallel, not 100% parallel. They put it far away. Because from here, if you measure the angle, it will be like, let's say, uh, 75.00001. You can never measure that in real life. So that's why they did this trick. Of course, it's just a trick. So now, they, from that time, the distance to the signs was like uh, 3 million miles away or something like that. It wasn't that far, all right? So 
Of course, uh, if, you, if you put the sun three mi- million miles away, the math is going to work with everything. But when it comes to the eclipse, they find that, you know, they have to play with the distances because something is going wrong. What is this something? There is something else called the angular diameter. The angular diameter of the sun and the moon are always, it's always 0.52 degrees. It doesn't change. Maybe 0.53 degrees sometimes. So, if you put the sun one million miles away, this is the diameter of the sun. You get the, you get the, uh, I mean the, the diameter, the size of the sun, you get it from the distance. If you get the distance, you get the diameter because you have to fit, you put the sun inside this angle of di- uh, angular diameter. You have to put it inside and not outside. All right? So if you want to change the size of the sun someday, you have to change the distance as well. You cannot make the sun bigger and put it here. It's not going to work for you, and everybody's going to think you are stupid because, because the angular diameter can be measurable from Earth. You cannot miss with that. 0.52 degree is something you can measure from Earth. So, uh, so they put the sun 93 million miles away, all right? And then a weird thing happened in, in 2017, in the eclipse that happened in 21 August. I don't know if you still remember that eclipse in the, over the United States, all right? A growing number of NASA scientists started to say that the sun is much bigger than what they thought it is. And yeah, uh, and Paul on the plane saw the news that I have seen before because we cannot find it anymore. I only found th- these ones. All right, uh, you cannot even see them. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, the news say uh, at that time that the, the sun was 250 times larger than the actual size. So imagine when you put the sun, when, when you make the sun of the sun, I mean the size of the sun, 250 times larger. You're going to put it so far away, so the distance is going to be big, huge. All right? And what does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, if you change the distance, it's not okay. I mean, if you change the distance, you would have a bigger problem because you are changing the radius of the Earth orbit. So the Earth orbits around the sun at an X radius. I don't know the number exactly. So if you change the distance to the sun, then you have to change the speed of the Earth. You have to change the speed. You, know, you, you don't have any other option because you are saying that the Earth is orbiting the sun. So you have to change the speed. And if you change the speed of the Earth, you have to change the speed of the moon because it follows the, the Earth, right? And if you change this and that, then you will have to change everything else. And NASA is too smart to do this. Because if they do this, it's going to be a pain in the ass. And nobody's going to believe them in this era of internet. Because we're going to communicate with each other. We're going to know it. And so if you were NASA, what do you want to do? What, what would you do? You're just going to let it go. You're just going to let it go because it's a pain in the ass. But we are not going to let that go, NASA. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, l- listen, this is the eclipse. This is their own website. They say the duration of the eclipse is five hours. All right? So if you do the math of the globe model, you will see that the eclipse should be only four hours, four hours and something. So it's, they are one hour off. And they know it. They know it. If you read this news, uh, I don't know. I mean, if you look it up, it's just one website, by the way. So um, if you look it up, you will see that the... They admit it. They admit that the size of the sun, they have to increase the size of the sun to make the eclipse work. It didn't work. And they said that after we debunked them many times. People like uh, Boss Darling from the Flat Earth 101 channel and probably um, Globusters and Jaronism did this. So uh, we've been debunking this eclipse for a long time and the duration of the eclipse doesn't work. It doesn't match reality. So they had to do something. All right? They had to make the sun, uh, the size of the sun bigger. And of course, if you increase the size, you increase the distance. If you increase the distance, you have to change the entire model. And they cannot do that. They cannot do that. Nobody's going to believe them ever. Anyway, uh, not to mention this, I mean, <laughs> you already know it. That's it. I mean, this is my, this is everything. And I want to tell flat earthers that if you want to draw the flat earth map, and you have to do it because this is the model. If you, if you don't have a map, you have nothing. So if you want to draw the map, stop playing with maps. Like Africa should be here. Australia should be here. This, this is not how you, how you draw the map. You don't know how the map look like. 
All right? So you have to start from the scratch. And how are you going to start from the scratch? You have to do the same thing they did. The same thing. And you, you, will, pass, you will go through the same problems and you will know how to solve them. You just have to focus. That's it. Because, I mean, I, I see a lot of people, a lot of flat earthers, and I don't want to offend anybody. They, they play with the... They play with, I mean, they, they draw the map using the Coriolis effect, time zones, flight duration. This is not going to work for anybody. I mean, if you, if you do that, you will never get the map exact. You have to do the angles because once you have the, the distances are, uh, in the right place, I mean, everybody is in the right place. If I say, if you go to that direction, you will find Egypt and you will find it in your map, then your map is accurate. Forget about stars. If you fix the map, everything else is going to work. That's it, guys. Thank you. Oh, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay, um, I'm now going to ask, um, thank you very much, Zach. The first time ever, eh? Um, Karen, if you could come up and get yourself ready, please, that'd be great. Um, while we're waiting for Karen to set up, I'm just going to do something that uh, Zach mentioned that I want to just ask. I'm about 1.86 meters, and I want um, a few of you in the uh, audience to actually um, tell me how far... 1.86? So I want you to tell me how far am I traveling? So, so can I ask how far did I travel? We mean when? <laughs> so, 15. Okay, so we've got two conflicting stories here. Well, two conflicting uh, answers. So you've got 10 and you've got 15. Any, other, any others on 10 and 15? 12. You just have to be right in the middle almost. Um, so the thing is, so using that, we'd have to actually measure it, and we've got to measure. How did they measure it in whatever, 2,500, 3,000 years ago? Uh, I don't know if he, uh, Zach used, um, if it was 1,037 kilometers or miles, but how did they get that? So I think they used some guy who just walked it and measured it. If you tried to measure it today with a tape measure over a period of time, you'd make a mistake. Would you agree? So anyway, where is Karen? Is Karen around? <laughs> okay. Karen, are you actually ready to go? Okay. Um, if you didn't get the headphone in, yeah. It's that one or this one, really. All right, um, could you please give, I don't know if you have, but give Karen a round of applause, please. Um, hi, my name's Karen B. I am going to probably take things in a little bit different direction than what you've been watching all day. It's not going to get very technical. I'm not going to throw a bunch of numbers at you. Um, Karen. Yes. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Okay, um, like I said, or if you didn't hear me, my, my talk goes in a much different direction than other people's. It's not debunking NASA, it's not very scientific. Well, it, there is science behind what I talk about, but it's a little bit different than what most people are used to hearing about. Um, my focus um, has been sort of like the, the mother point of view, the nurturer point of view, because that's what I am. I'm a mom, I have children. So when I came across the flat earth, my whole thing was, oh my God, what do I tell my children? <laughs> you know, what does this mean for us as far as, you know, our spirituality, our consciousness, um, how we handle our day-to-day -day lives? Because when you change your cosmology, obviously you change literally everything, right? It's not just the shape of the earth, it's everything. And if you have been researching flat earth, if, you know, you didn't, most people don't just come straight into the flat earth. They look at everything first. They're looking at political corruption, monetary, the financial corruption, medical corruption, um, the, the big pharma, uh, the food supply, what the people put in our food supply, the genetically modified foods, the poison they put on the food. I mean, it's just, it's everywhere and everything and I just think that it's really important to look at all this stuff how it all connects to flat earth and what it means for us so um, okay well, this slide doesn't really mean anything anymore okay well when I <laughs> when I was young you know and in school like most people you hear um, they start telling you about the heliocentric model and what it is and everything and these things a couple of things always really bothered me about it the most. The first was, you know, 
what we've been, which has been a big subject in Flat Earth here recently, is how do we have a pressurized system next to an infinite vacuum without a barrier? Like, how does that work? It's, it never made sense to me in school. Um, that one always bothered me. I had to just let it go. Um, so after Flat Earth, of course, and looking into it more, you know, I, I tend to think that this is more what our, what our um, Earth looks like. It's not correct, obviously. But to me, it makes sense that we would be living in an enclosed system. I mean, if you, if you have a pet or anything, you know, you make them, what do you do? You first, you make them a nice little habitat, something that's going to protect them from anything that could possibly come from the outside, right? So I feel like this is probably our habitat. Um, the other thing that bothered me when I was growing up is I, I have a couple of very vivid memories of being outside, because when I was young, that's what we did. We went outside and played outside. <laughs> um, but I remember looking up at the sun, and I was looking at it without any filter or glasses. It was just f filtered enough by the clouds that I could see the disk of the sun very perfectly. It was right there, and I remember thinking, it looks like it's just right there. I mean, it, I can see it perfectly, the outline of it. I mean, it just looked like a light bulb in the sky. That's what it always looked, to me, looked like to me. Um, so once I got into Flat Earth, um, and also talking to Zach and stuff a lot, obviously he focuses on the sun a lot, and I, that was sort of an interest of mine, so that's what I started to do. I started to look at the sun a lot. Okay, yeah, this is the eclipse. This is a video I took of the eclipse in August. Um, 2017, and I sped it up a little bit, but um, one thing about the eclipse that I noticed after watching it with my bare eyes, and I'm sure a few other people noticed, but anyways, what, what will happen here is this is me filming it with the filter on the P900, right? Well, once it gets to totality, I then remove the filter. Once you watch it, um, it's right now it's got the filter on, so as you can see, you can see the disk of the sun being occulted by what we assume is the moon. Um, there's really no evidence that it's the moon other than it's mathematically where the moon is supposed to be at that time. So everybody just says, yes, it's the moon occulting the sun. I can't really say, confirm or deny that either way. But once, once you get to totality, I will take the disk, I will take the filter off of the camera and then you will see you know, the sun being occulted by an object, supposedly the moon, and the way that the light rays come out from behind the, you know, around the objects in the sky, you see sort of this split side view of what looks like a magnetic field. So here the filter should come off, and it'll come back into focus, and you'll see, like, right here, it's coming around, this way and around that way, like up out the top and around the side, and it's doing it on both ways. So you see basically what, I mean, if you follow, if you're into the electric universe like most of us are, it's sort of hard to deny that you see these two objects in the sky, um, what, what they are, who knows, but they're showing you their electromagnetic signature when one is occulting the other during this eclipse. And also, if, if you were in the eclipse and you were happen to be lucky enough to be in the path of totality, when the light, you know, when it gets darker, it's, it's not a normal twilight light. It's not like when the sun is, is exiting and it's being filtered by the atmosphere in a regular way. It's, it's polarized. It's almost like a grayish light. It, it's, it's just not a normal twilight light. And if everything feels differently, the animals start acting differently. I mean, it is, you can't even really describe it unless you actually experience it for yourself. And once I was at this eclipse and stood in the path of totality, I realized why people become eclipse chasers. I mean, it is just such a unique experience. And you can watch it with your bare eyes. I mean, didn't we all, you know, they tell you, don't look at the sun, it's going to burn your eyes. But I mean, we, I looked right at it with my bare eyes almost the whole time, and my eyes were fine, you know. And we saw even President Trump looking at the eclipse right with his bare eyes. When you're not supposed to do that, but you can do it. And, and in fact, I think when you do that, it sort of, it, somehow that energy feeds you. I mean, th that's my opinion. Like, we are, 
in this creation, which is created for us, but we are also part of that creation, right? If the creator made this creation for us to live here, well, obviously, somehow our bodies are made for us to experience this place in a certain way. We're, you know, this place exists for us, and I also think, you know, this place, we exist because of this place. It's like the ultimate form of symbiosis, in my opinion. So, um, I guess I can skip that. So you can see the signature, and then I took some other eclipse pictures here, and then you can see an, a diagram of the magnetic field, and that kind of makes it more obvious what you're seeing when the sun is being occulted by the moon. Um, I'm sure you've seen this quote a couple times. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think of terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla. I mean, this is a, one of the most important quotes because of, you know, the work that this man did and how a lot of, it, of his work we probably have never even had access to because as soon as he died, you know, his, his uh, lab got raided, most of it had became classified, so we don't even know the, to the extent that he understood this stuff, probably more than much more of us are aware. Um, okay, so I think I have this out of order a little bit. Let me see. I'm missing a video. Okay, we'll work around it. Okay, so, so how does this relate to us? Um, is there a video in there of um, sunspots? Is there supposed to be a sunspot video? like a five or six minute video of sunspots, unless I didn't include it, which is entirely possible. <laughs> but I'll just skip around. Maybe I can get back to the sunspot video if it's in another place. Okay, so how does this relate to us? Um, well, like I was saying, you know, your body, this is your vessel, this is your antenna to work in this atmosphere, in this environment that has been made for us. Um, a lot of people, you know, now that we talk a lot about the ether, right? Well, Nikola Tesla thought the ether was real, along with a lot of other scientists, they thought the ether was real, right? They, in fact, they did stuff that they felt proved that the ether was real, and the ether was only dismissed when Einstein came around with this theory of relativity. Um, so my point to that <laughs> is that, well, how are they making it, how, how are they able to deceive us so easily, right? Well, they use... Their indoctrination system, they talk about the sun, you know, they have their eratosthenes and everything that you've seen everybody talk about, right? Like Zach and all them, whatever they were talking about. That's how they're, that's the model they present. But they also, in my opinion, do a lot of other things to us physically, mentally, um, to make it harder for us to see the deception, make it harder for us to function in this realm the way that we were truly meant to function. And I think the way that starts is vaccines. Because uh, the moment that you walk through that doorway, your mother is the doorway between the spiritual world and the physical world, you come through that doorway and the first thing they do is give you shots. Um, so here are some quotes from some doctors and they talk about, you know, vaccines, it's a, it's a gigantic hoax. Most doctors are convinced that they're useful, but if you look at the proper statistics and study of instances of these diseases, you'll realize that this is not so. My final conclusion after 40 years or more is this business of medicine is that the unofficial policy of the World Health Organization and unofficial policy of Save the Children's Fund, blah, 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 it's murder and genocide. Um, there is no scientific evidence that vaccinations are of any benefit, but it is clear that they cause a great deal of harm. Um, you know, and it just, there's a few of them, but it just goes on and on. Um, cancer in children is up, autism rates are up, and it's not, and they say, well, oh, now, you know, we can just diagnose it better. Well, no, I don't think that you can just diagnose it better. It's just that the instances are happening at such a more rapid rate. And they try to tell you it's genetic, but people don't breed that fast. I mean, it's, it's going way too fast for it to be just genetic. So, you know, to me it's clear that they're purposely making you sick with some of this stuff. Um, so, the discovery of the blood-brain barrier. This, this is a, a connection that I sort of 
made, you know, obviously I can't prove it, but just from looking at information, this is sort of me extrapolating, you know, they didn't learn about the blood-brain barrier until the 60s, right? That's when they realized that there was a blood-brain barrier and how it worked. Um, now, fetal development of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, they can't, they can't, they know that there's not a blood, a developed blood-brain barrier in children. They don't know when it starts or when it fully develops, but they know that it's not developed in young children under five. And everybody knows that when you go and get vaccines, you got to finish them all up by the time you're five. They do the first round by your two, and then they do it again. And by the time you're five, you've had like 40 or 60 shots or whatever. Um, the blood-brain barrier is a physical barrier between, you know, your the rest of your body and your brain, and what it's supposed to do is filter out any sort of toxins and keep them from getting to your brain. You know, so um, most of the things that you eat or whatever ingest into your body, the molecule is is so big that it can't get past that barrier. But they've purposely made these things smaller and attached them to different things so that they make it past this blood-brain barrier. And this is, you know, probably a big reason why we're getting more autism. Um, how the development of the blood-brain barrier across time affects barrier functionality is not well understood. It is clear that to each of these changes is necessary for the tight control of the blood-brain barrier demonstrable in adults. However, differences in permeability to drugs or of differing size or pharmacological properties across development are unknown and likely to be species dependent. Um, knowledge on how this affects us can't be gained from animal testing. Okay, so they, they, well, they say they can't, you can't figure this out by testing on animals. So they're just pumping this stuff into people. But you know, you can't test it on people. Well, they're not going to tell you they're testing it on people, but we're all their guinea pigs, right? Um, so these factors need to be kept in mind when studying the effects of the maternal environment on placental function and impacts of the central nervous system because a lot of the time they'll give the mothers the injections before the child is born and that happened to me. I was pregnant with one of my children and I received two flu shots because I was under the care of a military medical system and uh, I got these two flu shots and I felt like I was dying for a week. I couldn't move. I went into my next uh, checkup the Monday after. It was about a week after I got those shots, and they kept me there because they said, we can't find any amniotic fluid. Um, so these things are not good, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, I would never get a shot again, and I would never let any of my children ever get a shot again. Um, so here we have a little chart about disease mortality rates, just talking about more about you know the rates of these diseases before vaccines. Um, and see, they start introducing the vaccines, but it's already, the rate's already gone down. But then they'll tell you, oh, it's because we did these vaccines, but it's already gone down. Most of it had to do with um, them doing clean water systems and sanitary stuff that they would do. Um, yeah, so here it talks about clean water. Um, they started implementing clean water and sanitary things, and that's when the disease stopped uh, or started to decline. Um, this is a slide about Bill Gates issuing a, great, a grand challenge for a universal flu vaccine. We all know how Bill Gates thinks about vaccines. He thinks of it as population control, which is sort of counterintuitive to what you think vaccines would be. Um, here it talks about polio. Uh, they gave you the polio vaccine, but really what happened is they were spraying DDT all over America, and funnily enough, the side effects from DDT are the same as what they were telling you is from polio. They were telling you that it was causing people to be paralyzed and all that stuff, but really, <laughs> and then they start slipping in that polio vaccine and quietly stop spraying DDT everywhere, and now you have a magic polio vaccine that saves everybody. Um, if you want to, this is one thing I like to show people. Um, it's To me, it's like all you really need to look at. This is just this one page if you want to know the truth about vaccines and what, what the motive is behind them. Um, this is a thing that went through the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court basically gave um, a free pass to all these vaccine producers, right? So um, 
The Act provides that a party alleging a vaccine-related injury may file a petition for compensation in the Court of Federal Claims, naming the court must resolve the case by a specified deadline, blah, blah, blah. Um, but awards are paid out of the fund created by an excise tax on each vaccine dose. So they put an extra tax on the vaccines to put into the damage fund, so you're paying for the damage fund that they're causing you. That's where, the, that's where it comes from. Um, and then the manufacturers enjoy significant tort liability protections. Most importantly, the act eliminates manufacturer liability for a vaccine's unavoidable adverse side effects. Unavoidable. So they tell you right there, it's unavoidable. Not only is it unavoidable, we're not going to make them be responsible for it, and we're going to charge you the money that we're going to reward to everybody who, who claims vaccine injury. It's a big scam. So the second thing that they do, obviously, when they're done pumping your new baby full of vaccines and poison, then they, you know, they take your child and you put them in school. So this is what they end up looking like in school, right? That's just like soul crushing. They just, um, I don't know anybody who's been through the public school system. You must know how it is, right? You go into school, like you start out like this, right? Happy kid, you want to learn, you want to run, you want to play, and you're excited about learning about the world. And you have this like really this fire inside of you to learn, but then you start going through the system and then you end up like this. So this is the second way <laughs> that they, you know, hinder us. It's like they're setting us up to be even more and more disconnected from the creation that we were put in by the creator. Um, okay, now I'm getting back to the toroid stuff. So, Let me just get, think about what I'm saying here. <laughs> okay, so how does this all go together? Okay, well, there's a company called the HeartMath Institute, and they do a lot of studies about, um, you know, your heart and, you know, how it works and the fact that all of us have a electromagnetic field that's generated from our heart. Eero mentioned this a little bit in, in his, he didn't get into it too deep, but you do. You have an, everybody has an electromagnetic field, and it's generated by your heart, and it extends out around you by quite a few feet, and when you have equipment that measures this stuff, you can measure it up, you know, up to a few feet away from you. Um, this is a model of the toroid. Um, this is the same thing that we were seeing behind the sun during the eclipse when the light's coming out, you know, going up and around and out. Um, it's, it's a this is like a constant motion. It goes, it never ends. And even when, you know, the two circles get side by side, you get that infinity sign. I think that's where the infinity sign comes from. It's just like a side view of the toroid. It's, it just keeps going in, out, around. It's like this constant reciprocal motion um, that you're always, that's, everybody's got it. Okay. Um, and here is a magnetic field. Here is some top views of toroids. Um, it all ties into the golden ratio. You see it in phylotaxis. This, um, this, it's like the fingerprint of the creator, right? Basically, is what we're seeing here. Um, here is what they tell you a traditional atom is like. Um, and they kind of, it almost looks like a solar system. It looks a little bit chaotic. Um, that's what we all saw when we were growing up. Um, here we go. How do I play this? What's the play button? <laughs> How do you make it work? You're already out. Looks like there you go. There you go. Oh, okay. So. Here they have a new, this is where they're telling you they actually see an atom, and it's a hydrogen atom, but the hydrogen, it looks just like a toroid, right? That's what you're, they're telling you is an atom. It's like a single point of energy. Um, so this toroid is literally showing up everywhere and everything. Um, okay, well, I'll display while I go on to that next thing. So the point of I'm getting to with this is the electromagnetic field generated by your heart 
And the fact that the earth and everything is electromagnetic, the sun, the moon, the stars, I mean, it's obvious that it's all connected somehow. So how, um, what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, it's that intuition that they're breaking, they're sort of separating you from. They're separating you from who you really are and how you're supposed to work in this environment, right? So they're basically scrambling your radar with these vaccines, with this poison they put in the food, um, with the mental programming when you go to indoctrination camp, you know, they, and it all starts with them telling you that you live on this ball and you're a little speck of dust on nothing hurling through space. Nothing means anything. Um, and that's like, that's where the disconnect starts and then they just push you further and further away from it. They block you from using your intuition. Okay. But what you, what everybody needs to get back to is, Cleaning out your system, clean this poison out of your system, get back to, you know, learning how to use your intuition and re realize that your heart has a brain, okay? It's got neurons, it's got this electromagnetic field, which is, you know, it's actually many times more powerful than the one that is generated by your brain. And so when you're walking around in this place, you know, you're putting out subconsciously and consciously, you're always putting out information from from your heart, from your electromagnetic field. You know, it's, it's in the ether. It's, it's what we call intuitive communication. So um, right here, this is Anna Breitenbach. She's a woman who um, talks to animals, and I know a lot of people get upset and say I'm talking about New Age stuff, whatever, when I talk about this. But this is intuitive communication. This is how she's doing it. Um, you know, they can, they do tests with these things where they put, you know, uh, electrodes on a heart and they read the horse's heart rate compared to the heart, the, the brain waves of the horse's owner. And they, when they get together, the charts start to sync, right? So there's some sort of intuitive communication going on between these beings, even though we all don't speak the same language, you know, you're not going to speak English to a horse, but they read your feelings, your intuition, they read your energy. And this is all because of, you know, your body and your electromagnetic field and your putting that stuff out into the ether and everybody can pick it up. Everybody's got the same ability to do it. And uh, one example I like to give is, you know, when you're at home and you think about someone that's close to you that you have a connection with, the phone will ring and it's that person, right? Because that person was thinking about you or wanting to call you, that information then gets put out into the ether. You pick that up because you have that, con that connection and it's sort of proof that there is some sort of real precognitive intuition, intuitive communication that we're all capable of. And, you know, if they poison you guys and they brainwash you guys, they brainwash everybody out of this stuff, it's so much easier to lie to you about everything because you have no idea how to decipher a lie from truth on your own. You're not listening to yourself. You're not listening to the way things make you feel. I mean, you know, so in these examples, this is this woman. She's done a lot of work on herself spiritually. She says it makes it so she, her, she's like more in tune with this stuff. Um, so here, I'm going to play this video where she talks about it. And it's still not going. I mean, it's clearly an extraordinary gift. <laughs> and when did you know and how did you know you had this gift? Well, ironically, it's something that, that we all can do. It's something that is in the very nature of the way that our brains are designed. Right. And all our human ancestors right. used to do this every day as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. We modern humans tend to get educated out of it or become too busy with you know, daily life to, to pay attention to intuition. It's intuitive communication. Right. Yeah. So rediscovering it has been a journey of remembering and relearning something that's actually innate. And in my case, it happens to be perhaps a particular match for my passion, which is wildlife and conservation. And because I do it so much, perhaps my muscle is sort of more developed at it. Mm. But I'm really no different. I didn't have a privileged childhood running around in the wilds or have lions as pets or anything unusual. Very right. ordinary suburban yeah. upbringing. And this um, came about when I was doing my tracking training whilst living in the States mm. and coming across footprints of North American species that I knew nothing about at all, having grown up here. And when my brain completely failed to figure out what animal might have made those tracks, yeah. my intuition stepped in and began to give me brief snippets of information or a mental image of a dog-like face that would turn out to be a coyote. Sure. And it was a coyote's tracks. Okay, so that's her explaining that she, she had no idea what she was looking for. 
but you know, once she let go of that part of her brain and just listened to her intuition, she saw a coyote, and it was a coyote. Um, this is her with some troops of baboons in South Africa. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen how violent these things can be, but she's able to hang out with them and be accepted as part of the troop here. Um, here one more video of her discussing why um, the disconnect that people feel. Well, at the moment, the world is in quite a disconnected state, certainly as humans anyway. And to the extent that we've become so disconnected from nature, nature is struggling at the, at the hands of what humans are doing. What we're doing and what we're not doing, you know, how we're not being related anymore. So I think really that the humans are suffer, suffering from a great uh, separation sickness. And, and I do believe that humans are suffering from a great separation sickness that has obvious effects on, on all other beings on the planet at the moment. This phenomenon of disconnection and separation certainly seems to be a, a modern ailment. This is not just about us human animals connecting with non-human. It's happening out there the whole time between the plants and the animals who browse them, between the birds. Okay, I don't know what happened. But anyways, you can see <laughs> the basic point she's saying is that there's a major disconnect between us and our environment. Now, she's not a flat earther. She's not going to put it together that it's because we've been lied to about where we live. But, you know, that to me seems pretty obvious. That's why there is a disconnect. That's why we don't get along. It's why it's so easily, we're so easily influenced by all these outside things, these outside sources around us, right? Um, because we've lost all touch with our intuition and who we really are. Do, do any of you feel like you want to go conquer your neighbor and take all their resources and just keep going on and on and on until you built this empire? No, that's not how normal people think. You just want to have what you need, be happy, raise your children, enjoy your life. That's what most people want, right? But then they would have you think that, oh, there's this big boogeyman over on the other side of the ocean that wants to come and take everything from you. No, they don't. They just want to be left alone, just like everybody else. Um, okay, yeah, my slides are way out of order. I apologize. <laughs> um, but Earth's um, electromagnetic field, it's something called the Schumann resonance. Um, it's an extremely low frequency portion of Earth's electromagnetic field spectrum. Schumann, Schumann resonance are quote unquote global. Electromagnetic resonances, resonances generated and excited by lightning discharges of the cavity formed by the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. So, and there's a lot of studies about how this resonance affects us and our behavior. When there's weird spikes in the resonance, you know, certain things will happen. There'll be certain events going on, um, sort of disruptions that sort of are taken all over the world. Um, now, the, the government has done a lot of studies on this stuff, on intuitive communication. They know all about it. They know how it works. They even have little secret programs called the Gateway Program, where they explore the development of human consciousness um, uh, designed with the individual and the government. Uh, expanded awareness, okay? achieve and willfully control his physical body and the out-of-body state, communicate with and visit other energy structures and, real and realities. Um, so, and this is, oh, well, there's no date on this one. But they were doing this in the 70s and 80s and even before that. Um, and if you listen to any of what Anna Breitenbach says about her intuitive communication when she talks to animals, she can do it to, she, she will just, communicate with anybody anywhere on the plane. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, um, it's non-local, so the distance doesn't matter. It's instant, right? And they even say here that the long wavelength is occurring about 40,000 kilometers or just about the perimeter of the planet. In other words, the signal from the movement of our bodies will travel around the world in about the seventh of a second through the electrostatic field in which we are embedded, which um, they call it an electrostatic field, I think they're talking about the ether when they say that. But they're not going to say the ether, right? Because the ether can't exist if the Earth is a globe. Um, so, such a long wavelength knows no obstacles. Its strength does not attenuate much over large distances. Naturally, it will go through just about anything, metal, concrete, water, um, and the fields making up our body. This is the ideal medium for conveying a telepathic signal. 
Um, and this is something that everybody is capable of doing, everybody. You know, there's not one person like Anna Breitenbach, she's not, you know, she doesn't have some f special physical ability, you know, something in her body that the rest of us don't have. She doesn't have a special gland, you know, or something, you know, she's just a normal person, woman, just like everybody else. She's just more in tune with this, right? So she's more in tune with that communication and she can read it better, you know? And I think that this is something that everybody should think about in the back of your mind. Most people are, you know, I can understand why everybody's more, you know, um, concerned with the scientific part of it, the math part of it, you know, the experiments and all that stuff. But you also have to take into account that if you don't know where you live, if you don't know your true place in the universe, you're not going to know yourself and you're not going to know your own abilities and you're not going to know what, you know, what you were really meant to be here, what you were really meant, how you were really meant to experience this. I mean, to me, this is the secret of, of really, you know, living this life to the fullest and enjoying our time here instead of being worried about going to work or stressing about these things that don't matter. I mean, they've really got you trapped in this material world. And it's just so much more than that. I mean, you hear it uh, over and over again that we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. And that's true. But because we are in a physical world with physical bodies, having a physical experience, what they do to that physical body is going to affect you spiritually. That's just the way it is here. So that's sort of what I want to draw attention to. Okay, here is the, um, the slide I was looking for earlier <laughs> with the, our electromagnetic field. Um, the heart is 100,000 times stronger electrically and up to 5,000 times stronger magnetically than the brain. And this is another thing, when you, when you grow up, what do they tell you? Think with your head, not with your heart, right? That's what they tell you. But if you're sad, where do you feel it? You feel it in your heart. If you're happy, you feel it in your heart. If you're stressed or scared, I mean, you get that sinking feeling in your chest, you know? So there's something to be said about listening to those feelings you're getting in your heart. Because your heart is sending and receiving, literally, information from the ether. It goes to your heart. Your heart then tells your brain what to do. It's not the, you know, everybody thinks it's the other way around, but it's not. You know, so this is something that, you know, is good to pay attention to. And the more you pay attention to it, the more things you do to decalcify your pineal gland. You know, take some iodine, drink distilled water, stop eating poison, eat clean food. You know, don't drink Coke. Zach. Um, <laughs> so here's another thing. This is, um, this is a little video about the heart, um, because they tell you that the heart is a pump. It's got four chambers, right? And it's just pumping all the blood out. But, but this doctor did a lot of studies on the heart and the heart is actually a rope. It's twisted. It's, um, it is shaped in the form of a helix, which goes back to... The heart is much more than a pump. It's a rope, and it wraps around itself in the form of a helix or a spiral. This is called the helical heart. Dr. Francisco Torrent Guasp found that the myocardial fibers of the heart form a spiral shape, as you can see here. Watch as he dissects a cow heart to reveal the true physiology of the heart. The standard four-chamber pump model of the heart is inaccurate. The heart is actually twisting and untwisting, creating a pressure pulse of energy that goes throughout your body. You can clearly see the toroidal shape as this image moves down the muscular band to the apex. The loops of the band turn in opposition, two reciprocal spirals merging at the apex. Fibonacci spiral and the golden ratio are seen in nearly everything you find in nature. Land animals and sea animals. Shellfish. The spiral pattern viewed from the side reveals the structure of a wave. The shape of our DNA. In phyllotaxis, the pattern in which the florets grow in a hypotrochoidal pattern or a spirograph. or how branches grow on a bush or a tree. Everything growing from the center out in nature's logarithmic spiral, increasing by a factor of phi every quarter turn. 
The golden mean in a circle has an angle of 137 and a half degrees. Showing up in butterfly wings, feathers, shapes, as well as our own bodies. We find this ratio so attractive, we put it in our most important architecture, including the pyramids of Giza. Even our visible spectrum of light follows the divine proportion. Our heart generates the strongest bioelectrical and magnetic field in our entire body, stronger than the brain by a hundred times. The HeartMath Institute has been researching the role of the heart as a source of wisdom and intelligence that we can use to better balance our lives, increase creativity, and enhance our intuitive capabilities to improve our health, relationships, and spiritual fulfillment. They state that the heart's magnetic field, which is the strongest rhythmic field produced by the human body, not only envelops every cell of the body, but also extends out in all directions into the space around us. The heart's magnetic field can be measured several feet away from the body by sensitive magnetometers. Research conducted at HMI suggests that the heart's field is an important carrier of information. Evidence now supports the perspective that a subtle yet influential electromagnetic or energetic communication system operates just below our conscious level of awareness. They found that there is a direct relationship between the heart rhythm patterns and the spectral information encoded in the frequency spectra of the magnetic field radiated by the heart. So information about a person's emotional state is encoded in the heart's magnetic field and is communicated throughout the body and into the external environment. This information can in turn be detected by others and processed in the same manner as internally generated signals. This is the science behind intuitive communication. Okay, so that was supposed to play a little bit earlier. My slides got out of order. I apologize, but, and I got to wrap up. But so that's my point is, you know, electromagnetic universe, we are electric. Everything sort of matches, it goes together, it makes sense. So just pay attention to that. Do you know, when you feel, it's like when you feel somebody's feelings, if they're, if you sense somebody's upset, this is how you're doing it. You know, this is what's happening. But most people aren't aware of it. You know, they, you think it's just, it's a sixth sense. It's, it's, you know, something magical, but it's not. Everybody's capable of it. Everybody can do it. Everybody should get more in touch with it because I think if we were more in tune with our intuitive communication, you would be more sensitive to those around you. And even, you know, it's like subconsciously, if you're not, if you don't want to talk to people about Flat Earth or about the deception, you're still adding to that. You're putting that information out there just because you know. And I tell that to people, it's okay if you don't want to talk about it. It's okay if you don't want to, you know, go out and do street activism. Just because you know, they are putting that information out there and other people are picking it up subconsciously, whether they want to admit it or not or whether you believe it or not. And this is why I think the movement has been growing exponentially and so fast. And so many people, you know, they, they know with the lies, but they don't want to talk about it. They stay in the closet because they're afraid of the ridicule. But um, this is what's going on. So that is it. I will wrap up um, that part of it. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, we've got now our last speaker, uh, Mark Devlin, is going to speak for, uh, I guess, about half an hour. What we are also going to do is, because we're actually okay till six, um, if people have got questions, uh, maybe we can invite the speakers to come up on stage. And if any one of you have got questions, if there is no questions, then great, we'll just wrap up early. But if you have, um, then obviously that is something we're going to try and do. And then we're going to finalise it with... Um, for the last five minutes, I'm going to get Dee Dee up here because um, I'll, I'll say it now because while Mark's setting up, um, the amount of work that Dee Dee's put into this event, I mean, she's done far greater than me, um, but she found the venue, she spoke to the campsite, she did all the admin along the way. And most of you in this room have probably dealt with Dee Dee 
and I just want to make sure she comes up here and gets some recognition. So as she's not in the room, when she is here, I would love it if you could give her a, a nice round of applause. Not now, but <laughs> when she's there. Um, right, Mark. Where's Mark? Okay. Um, okay, um, while we're waiting for a couple of seconds, um, has anyone got any thoughts, questions, or observations that they want to shout out? Not all at once. Okay. I saw, uh, oh, I saw on broad daylight a full moon, and I thought it was a little bit strange because it's not possible to have a full moon uh, in the ball system, I think. Hmm? Yeah, but if you could have a full moon during the night and a full moon during the day, it doesn't add up to me. Then how could it be the reflection of the sunlight? So that shows that shows it in plain sight actually that something is yep. wrong. Okay, I'm going to pass you over to Mark now. I say it's been about half an hour, then we're just going to wrap up with some questions. Uh, I do have a few announcements, but I'll, I'll do that reference time. Thank you. No, no it's 30. Oh, okay. 30. Can you do it in 30? Uh, well, I'm going to have to, aren't I? Oh, well, I'll use one of these. So which one? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Hello, hello. All right, thank you. Well, my talk is the token non-flat earth presentation to round out the day, although it does segue quite well out of Karen's. Uh, I am totally on board with everything that's been discussed today, but I'm very far from an expert on these points, so I prefer to stick with what I know well. Uh, but I do just want to uh, relate a quick anecdote before I get into the main material. When I was preparing the uh, writing of my book, Musical Truth Volume 1, which I put out in early 2016, the writing process had occurred through 2014 and 2015. And during that time, the issue of the idea that we might not live on a spinning ball hurtling through the infinite vacuum of space after all had come across my radar. And like many people, initially I scoffed at it. I thought it was ridiculous. I just wanted to push it away. But it kept on coming back. And every time it kept bouncing back to me, I decided to uh, look into it a little bit further. And eventually I got sold on the whole thing. But by the time I was fully convinced that we had been lied to about the cosmology of where we live, the uh, manuscript of my book had gone off to be typeset. And I realized that in the wordage, it was absolutely littered with the phrase global. And so I recalled it, and I changed every reference to global to worldwide, and then put it out there. And I feel very happy that I did. There is actually a common thread running between uh, everything we've heard about today and what I'm about to present, and that is duplicity and deception, and the fact that the public is always the last to know. So my presentation is titled The Weaponization of Sound. I'm starting with a quote from the BBC, believe it or not. I don't often quote from the BBC. They're not exactly known for being a paragon of truth and virtue. But I couldn't disagree with this statement from Susie Klein on a show which went out a couple of years ago, where she says, she, she talks about music's, music's uncanny ability to stir us up, to calm us down, to express every possible human emotion. It bypasses language and reason and aims instead directly for our souls. Uh, music can console us and it can corrupt us, inspire resistance or collusion. So she's speaking to the idea that sound and the manipulation of it, because everything in this existence is made up of sound and light frequency, as we've heard on a few occasions today. Uh, if 
the manipulation of sound falls into the hands of those who have malevolent intent and don't have humanity's best interests at heart, then the results can be quite devastating. This was actually uh, referenced in a record by Kate Bush that she put out in the 80s called Experiment 4. This is the music video for it. And in the song, she talks about a military-grade experiment. That's a surprise, isn't it? Which is all about using sound as a weapon. It's had many references in popular culture through the years, this subject, even in the Tintin uh, adventures by Hergé, the Belgian uh, cartoonist. So in this particular story, The Calculus Affair, Tintin and Captain Haddock discover that Professor Calculus is working on a machine designed to uh, use sound as a weapon to destroy cities. And he's uh, it falls into the hands of these world superpowers that want to use it to destroy their enemies. Well, in actual fact, Hergé based that story on very real technology. Over on the right here, we can see uh, what he based it on, which came out of Germany during the World War II years. And there's also a reference to this type of technology in this article here from 2008. And it talks at the beginning there of higher volumes of infrasound affect the human central nervous system, causing disorientation, anxiety, panic, bowel spasms, nausea, vomiting, and eventually unconsciousness. That's what sound can do in the hands of the wrong people. You know, it's interesting because Greta Thunberg uh, forgot to mention this in her address to the United Nations last week when she's talking about these imminent threats to human health and well-being. Uh, I guess it just slipped her mind, you know. And uh, this is, by the way, the same technology which is used as the basis for the 5G rollout, which is planned for us all very soon. That is a military-grade technology based on the same sort of stuff we're talking about here. So what could possibly go wrong, right? We get into a real hot potato when it comes to discussion of the music industry and the ways in which it's used to manipulate the general public. And this is the issue of 432 versus 440 hertz. So musicologists and audiophiles and sound engineers will tell you that 432 is a very natural harmonic frequency for musical instruments to be pitched at. So the idea is that the A note is pitched to 432 hertz, and then all the other notes in the composition fall into line accordingly. The alternative application to that is 440 hertz, and this has actually been the international standard to which musical instruments and most recorded music that we get as consumers is pitched at. So these same scientists of sound will tell you that 440 is anything but a harmonic frequency and anything but a natural choice for us to be listening to music at. They will tell you that it's very discordant, it's very dissonant, it doesn't sit well with human physiology, human brain waves, and actually it creates states of anxiety and disturbance. And this has been observed many times in experiments. Now the figures here become very interesting. So 440 is the one that, according to these experts, we should be chucking out, and we should be remaining with 432. And it struck me some time back that 432 falls into place in a very fascinating cosmic sequence that we get. It's very unique in nature. It's not repeated with any other uh, sequence of numbers. And this particular sequence starts with 27, and that puts me in mind straight away of the fabled 27 Club that we get in uh, music legend, all these artists that have passed away at the age of 27 in strange circumstances. But either way, what you do here is you double the number each time. So from 27, you get to 54, then it's 108, 216, there's the 432, then you double that to get to 864. And we see so many applications of this sequence uh, in many walks of life and in nature. So yogic schools teach that all living beings exhale and inhale 21,600 times a day. Doesn't matter where you put the zeros in this, by the way. It's the main core figures that are important. The Kali Yuga is said to last 432,000 years, being part of the Great Cycle, which itself lasts 4,320,000 years. There are 864,000 seconds in a day. 
432,000 for day, 432,000 for night. So it seems this figure 432 is encoded into nature and creation itself. It becomes very interesting to take this further as well, particularly in light of you know what we're all here for and the information that we've heard today. Now, uh, most of us probably reject these figures. 864,000 miles seems to be a rather optimistic diameter for the sun if it really is only 3,000 odd miles away. But these are the official figures which have been put out there for these luminaries. So we're told that 800, 864,000 miles is the diameter of the sun. Then, according to many claims, the moon has a diameter of 2,160 miles. So again, it's different representations of this same sequence and the same figures. One astrological age in a precessional cycle is said to be 2,160 years. And before I got into all this stuff, and when I was still uh, a mainstream news and media believer, I was a follower of Graham Hancock. I thought he was a great author. I loved his book, Fingerprints of the Gods. In that book, I can recall that he said the Great Pyramid of Giza is a representation of the northern hemisphere of the Earth on a scale of 43,200. Then we hear that the polar diameter of Saturn is given as 108,000 kilometers, and its orbital period is said to be 10,800 days. So the point here is that I don't accept these figures, and I suspect that many or most of you don't either. Uh, they appear to be grossly fabricated, but it's very interesting that whoever did apply these figures and tell us things like the diameter of the sun is 864, 4,000 miles, seem to have some awareness of this sequence, which presents itself in nature. Uh, the 432s, the 864s, and all these different uh, you know, evocations of this sequence. And just to add an additional mind blower to this, I got it from Marty Leeds from listening to one of his radio shows many years ago. Marty is into gematria, applying numerical values to letters. And in this particular broadcast, he mentioned the word Jesus, which if you apply it to, uh, I think it's Jewish gematria, it comes out as 45666. Interesting last three figures, right? But he totally blew my mind by revealing that if you multiply all of these figures together, you end up with 43,200. So it suggests to me that 432 hertz is indeed something which is encoded into nature by the creator, and it is the frequency with which we should be listening to our music. Unfortunately, most people are absorbing music at the dissonant frequency of 440, and that will not be by accident. This guy is Dr. Masuro Amoto, who passed away a few years ago, but he was a Japanese scientist who looked into uh, the science of sound and the effect that uh, sound frequencies and vibrational frequencies of words have on water. This was his speciality. He would expose uh, containers of water to particular words. Now, these could be words that are spoken, so you get the resonant frequency of the, the audio, or it could be a word in written form, the idea being that the word still carries the vibrational frequency signature. Uh, whether you speak it or whether it's written, it's still attached to the word. He would then freeze the water very quickly, and under a microscope, study the patterns that were formed in response to these words. So here's some of the results. Whenever you get a word which is charged with positive, benevolent intent, you get these beautifully uh, geometric and harmonic patterns. But when you expose it to phrases like, you fool, you make me sick, evil, and stuff like this, you get all these chaotic... Uh, hazardous kind of uh, patterns, which are anything but harmonic. There's a few more examples there. And some more. You make me sick, I will kill you. Doesn't produce the best results, it seems. When we look at the sonic signatures of audio recordings under an oscilloscope, we often come across what is known as a sawtooth wave. And this crops up quite often in popular music. That's how a sawtooth wave looks under a, an oscilloscope. And uh, there was this guy, William, however you pronounce that, who uh, appeared in this 
video interview that's available on YouTube. You can look it up there using the description at the bottom. Uh, this guy claims to have been a, a former druid working for the uh, control system, but he went over to the light side and he revealed some of the secrets of what he was into. So he talked about the sawtooth wave and he said it's a very disagreeable sound like the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard. Uh, and he says, what I find extremely interesting is that some of the fuzz effect and these weird sounds that people like The Who and Jimi Hendrix and these early pioneers of rock music would do, a lot of that involves sawtooth waves. We get into the music of Jimi Hendrix again when we get into another aspect of uh, sound production. And this is what's known as the tritone. The tritone is an interval between notes, which is three whole tones apart. And this has long been considered to be uh, very harmful for people to absorb. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church apparently banned the tritone from any of the music that was being produced at the time because they just care about us and want to help us, you know. Uh, so, so there's an example of that. It was also known as the Devil's Interval because it was supposed to be just so dissonant and so uh, distressing for people to experience in a piece of music. Well, a very good example of the tritone, according to musicologists, would be Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze. If you think about the opening chords to that, that is an example of a tritone in action. Uh, it's reputed to have been banned by the Catholic Church, as I said, uh, and it's been greatly favoured by some of rock's more raucous performers from the 1960s onwards. So Black Sabbath's eponymous song is said to offer another prominent showcase of the tritone, along with much of the output of Slayer. That's a surprise, isn't it? The Million Song data set. This was an archive uh, charting the progression or regression, you might say, of pop music between 1955 and 2010. So you had these expert analysts that were looking into the compositions of these pop songs. And they concluded that music has been getting dumber. And pop songs that have been served up to us have been more and more simplistic in their makeup. And that actually artificial intelligence algorithms are reporting what is going to make a catchy pop tune with a good hook that's going to draw people in. And the reason they've got dumber is because the attention spans of the average members of the public have been dwindling with all these other things vying for our attention. Uh, you know, the, the spans that people have to be able to concentrate on something are now down to a few seconds. So the reason pop music is now so bland is because the AI algorithms are recommending that you get more of these stupid sing-along hooks and all this to uh, keep the listeners on board for as long as possible. Another thing that we have in the modern era when it comes to the way music is served up to us is that everything is now digitally, electronically produced. And a lot of people listen to most of their music in the form of MP3s. So the MP3 encoding process takes a much larger file, which has a full frequency audio range, and compresses it. And it does that to... Make a smaller file, which can be shared more easily, takes up less disk space. But the way this is achieved is that the process strips out aspects of the recording that it deems to be imperceptible to the human ear. So it might be a particular bass line, it might be a particular frequency. It gets rid of it, but it's so, uh, it's done so subtly that the listener is unaware that this aspect of the recording is missing. So it strikes me that if you can strip away parts of a recording without anyone being consciously aware of it, then the opposite can be true. And you can be adding elements to a recording, you can be adding sound frequencies, and these are also totally imperceptible to the people on the receiving end of it. So it raises all kinds of questions about what's going into the music that we're now getting uh, presented with, given that it's all digital and electronic in nature. And this brings in uh, aspects of another presentation, which I did. Just got a few slides from it here. Mind control through electronic dance music. This is uh, a subject of great interest to me. Uh, in the late 80s, I was right there at the forefront of the acid house rave scene when it emerged in the UK. 
Got caught up in that whole thing. I was very much into the music and the clubbing scene. Never actually did the drugs. I was always too level-headed for that, and I lived a sheltered life. But uh, when it comes to the music, I was very much into it. So I've come to some discoveries in recent years about what the electronic dance music scene could now be getting used for when we look at the picture long term. So the acid house rave scene, which grew up in the UK in the late 80s and then gave birth to the era of the super clubs in the 90s, to my mind, was very much a reboot and a repackaging of what had been done earlier in the 1960s with the hippie counterculture scene. So in that movement, you had new forms of music, psychedelic rock and country rock and folk rock coming along to replace the styles that were there previously. You had a seemingly unending supply of LSD popping up everywhere at all these music festivals and hippie communes. And when you get into the research, you find that most of it got put out there by the CIA, who were directly responsible for uh, this influx of LSD. And then you had uh, all these music festivals like uh, the Monterey Pop Festival and Woodstock and Altamont and all these others, where hordes of these hippies would gather, do the drugs, listen to the music, and just trip on out. Well, there's so much evidence now available to show that that whole scene, to a very large extent, occurred at the hands of military intelligence agencies who wanted to control the whole thing and steer it off in desired directions and monitor and surveil the results at every step of the way. So to my thinking, what we had in the UK 21 years later, kicking off in 1987-88 with the acid house scene, was simply a repackaging of that whole dynamic on the opposite side of the Atlantic. So this time, instead of LSD, you had the ready availability of ecstasy, E, MDMA, which was absolutely everywhere in those times. And there is some evidence to show that many of the pills that turned up at that time were coming out of military intelligence as well, British military intelligence this time. You had very different styles of music, electronically produced dance music, which was replacing the styles that had been there previously. And you had all these warehouse parties, open air raves, uh, free festivals, and then latterly super clubs where all these kids would get together under the influence of the drugs, listening to this new music. And again, these situations would have been monitored and surveilled as well. So that's what I feel was going on there. Now, this dude, Terence McKenna, is often revered in consciousness circles as something of a guru. Many people I know hang on his every word and you know think he's some kind of demigod in terms of the wisdom that he dispensed about plant medicines and human connectedness to uh, nature and all of this. Unfortunately, uh, there is also evidence to suggest that Terence McKenna was working for at least a time uh, in the employ of the FBI, or at least in association with the FBI. But I just want to present to you uh, an aspect of this lecture that he delivered called Evolution in London in 1992. This was right in the midst of the birth of the super club scene, which had come off the back of Acid House. So in this lecture, he said, with electronic culture, you can create shamans for the global, his word, planetary village. And this, to my mind, is the function that rock and roll played in the 60s, and house music should play in the 90s. So he's making the connection there himself between these two scenes. Through emphasis in house music and rave culture on physiologically compatible rhythms, sound, properly understood, can actually change neurological states in large groups of people getting together, creating a telepathic community of bonding that hopefully would be strong enough that it would carry the vision out into the mainstream of society. He's just explained the dynamic that takes place at these events where you've got the combination of subliminal Im images being planted into the subconscious mind of the, the people present. You've got the mind-altering uh, aspects of the drugs that are being consumed. You've got this electronically produced music. And you've got this kind of hive mind mentality where all the people present at one of these raves, one of these music festivals, are all kind of on the same vibe and all being exposed to the same frequencies. And we've got more of the same idea some 
almost 30 years later, on a show that was put out by the BBC, again, BBC4. It was screened in 2017, and it was talking about the cultural significance of the worldwide dance music movement. And this guy, Moby, DJ and music producer, who just happens to be descended from Herman Melville, the author of the Moby Dick novels, which is how he got his name, made this quote, very similar to the McKenna one. He said, if we were sitting here 25,000 years ago, someone might ask, what do you think is compelling those people to bang on logs and dance around a fire while lights flicker in their eyes? You also just described modern dance culture. So an anthropologist could use those same terms to describe music and dancing and hedonism 20,000 years ago or five minutes ago. He's speaking to these primal base desires that exist within us as humans to dance and celebrate and uh, stimulate our minds artificially. And he's saying, you know, this could have been the case thousands of years ago. And what we're seeing now with the dance music scene, which is massive all over the world, literally in every corner of it, uh, is just a modern enactment of this phenomenon that's been with us forever. So looking at where the electronic dance music scene is at now and bearing in mind that it's got literally millions of dedicated followers all around the world, uh, the fan base is absolutely massive. We have all these events with all the light shows that accompany it and all the decor and stuff. It becomes interesting to look at some of the names of the very largest dance music events which take place. So we have Dream State in California. Right here in the Netherlands, Trance Nation and Luminosity are two big ones. Velvet Hypnotized, Atlantis, Spring Awakening, Awake, Dream Beach, Delirium Eternity, Electronic Family, Digital Society, Digital Dreams, Tomorrow World, Tomorrow Land, Future Music Festival and New Horizons. So looking at these names, they all evoke ideas of altered states of consciousness, dream states, and very specifically, a transhumanist, artificial intelligence, smart grid, internet of things, reality, which is now upon us. We're not even marching towards it anymore because it's here. So looking at names like electronic family, digital society, digital dreams, tomorrow world, this to my mind, is evoking ideas of where human society is headed at the hands of the crazy psychopaths that we have in control. It's revering transhumanism, it's revering electronic and digital ways of doing things, and artificial intelligence as really great and where the future is headed. And it's in training the young people who attend all these dance music festivals, to accept technology as something that's really good, that's something that's to be embraced. So we see it here in all the, the names that are being subliminally fed into the minds of these people. And when they're under the influence of mind-altering chemicals, and they've got all these subliminal uh, sound frequencies coming through the music, and all the images coming through the decor that you get at these events, then that's some very powerful mind control at work. And just looking at the geographical spread of these events, you will notice that they are literally all over the world. We've got events here in Bali, LA, Chicago, the Netherlands, you know, every corner you could think of. These are comments from a couple of former ravers. So it's people that would be now in their middle age, but back in the day when they were young and impressionable, they used to go along to these events and they got swept up in the whole spirit of it. These comments were taken from uh, a discussion on the David Icke forum, where a bunch of you know grizzled old former ravers were reflecting on what it was they were a part of. These are some very key comments, I feel. One person said, when the music got more and more hardcore, some of it used to make me feel like it was trying to take over my mind. Not sure how to explain the feeling, but I remember being at a rave and not liking what the beat was doing. Somebody else said, I think music can be used to amplify the dimensions from which it is created. If you make music with evil thoughts, give it evil rhythms, it will produce evil vibrations. And the people that were commenting on this forum were from every corner of the earth as well. You had ravers from Australia comparing notes with ravers from California, from Europe, 
very interesting with the benefit of hindsight to think back on what these scenes may really have all been about and also what they were preparing for, what they were leading in, which is where we're at now, in my view. Then some more comments. It's not in the beats, but in the tonal qualities of the music. If you have the wrong type of distortion, you can have odd order harmonics entering into a sound you like and are tuned into. And then somebody says, rave music is more guilty than other genres. The 303, which is the Roland 303 uh, synthesizer sampler, is a transistor-based saw and square generator. And the filters on that thing generate mostly odd order harmonics. So you get the picture. It's all about how sound frequencies wrongly handled or handled by people with the wrong kind of motives can be doing us great harm. But... Uh, we're getting on to the positive stuff. I want to leave things on a positive note, as I generally tend to. Just as sound can be weaponized, the reverse is a possibility, as I mentioned earlier. And this is where so much hope lies. So, music as used for healing and sound frequencies for healing. In the same way that they can do great harm, they can also do great good if we tap into the right frequencies and make that reconnection back to our inherent nature and our connectedness to everything else in creation. So it's said that with memory loss brought on by, by dementia, dementia, the melodies and lyrics of favorite songs are the last to go, and exposure to fondly remembered music has been known to bring people out of deeply entrenched comas. There's an institution in London known as the Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy Center, which specializes in this. They apply music and also the human voice uh, and it's been claimed that they've got autistic children to communicate for the first time. And it's also been known to, pe to bring people out of persistent comas when all else has failed. This goes some way to explain why favorite songs mean so much to us. And all you've got to do is hear a song on the radio from years ago, and you feel that tingle going up your spine, you get goosebumps on your arm, you can remember exactly where you were when the, the record came out, you can remember your emotional state at the time. It all comes flooding back to you just through listening to the arrangement of the sound frequencies and that piece of music. It's very powerful. According to this article, memories of music cannot be lost to Alzheimer's and dementia. Sorry this is so text-heavy, by the way, and very wordy, but this subject doesn't really lend itself to visuals too much. Uh, so, wrapping up, if you're especially into a piece of music, your brain does something like autonomous sensory meridian response. This is from the article that we just saw. Which feels to you like a tingling in your brain or scalp. It's nature's own little buzz, a natural reward that is described by some as a head orgasm. According to a recently published study, the part of your brain responsible for ASMR doesn't get lost to Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's tends to put people into layers of confusion, and the study confirms that music can sometimes actually lift people out of the Alzheimer's haze and bring them back to normality, if only for a short while. It all speaks to the healing powers of music and sound. Wrapping up with another comment from the BBC, again, would you believe it? Truth from the BBC. Who'd have credited it? Uh, this is from Radio 2's Faith in the World program that they put out a few years ago, where this person, Jayadev Richardson, a session drummer, says, Sound vibration is everything because the whole universe, according to Vedic literature, was created by sound. Sound is the first thing that we experience in the mother's womb, and it's the last thing that shuts down when we die. So to hear the right kind of sounds is vital. Free will choice is always present in our existence. Just as sound can be used to control and enslave us, so it could provide a gateway to the type of positive and uplifting experience we would all prefer to be having. So as with all things in life, it comes down to free will choice, our greatest gift that we're endowed by the Creator. So we have the free will choice to make better decisions as to the sounds that we take in. Many of the aspects that I've talked about today are in my two books. I think I've only got four copies left out there, but if anyone is interested in a copy, I do have them, and there's a whole lot more in there besides. Other than that, I want to thank everyone for listening. I think we're at the end of the day, and I've finished just about on time, so thank you. Um, 
I, I just said to um, Mark, I just thought that was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Um, okay, this is a couple of things I forgot to mention earlier. On the Globe Light Tour, uh, there was a, a chap that was going to come with some people, and he was going to come on the Sunday, but obviously we had to cancel the Sunday for obvious reasons. Um, and the £170 that he was going to get refunded, he's actually donated, he told me to donate it to the Globe Light Tour, and I forgot to mention it earlier. Um, I'm also going to do um, just uh, five or ten minutes speakers' questions. If any of you got uh, questions um, for the guys here, um, that'd be something else. And um, also tonight, we're not too sure what the speakers want to do, but we're actually either going to go to the camp and stay there, or we're going to maybe come back to Amsterdam. And obviously, I would like to think that if you guys are in Amsterdam and you want to um, attend with us, we'd like to see you and also get your thoughts on what you've seen. Um, we are still able to be in this venue for a little while, but we do have to be out um, soon because they're giving us a deadline. Um, but also, I would like to bring uh, Didi up because I think that she needs a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> See what, yeah, I don't. I don't like to be in the spotlight. That's not my thing. So, it was a big success. A lot of people turned up. We made a lot of friends. We had some fun today. And if you want to join tonight, who knows where we end up? It's Amsterdam. So you, you'll find out on live streams on on the Facebook group. I'll try to update it. If there's anything you want to give some feedback or, or say something, just let me know. I've been here all day and I'm not going anywhere yet. So. Thank you all. Okay, is, um, has anyone got any questions? Uh, what one's thinking is if, if anyone's got a particular question for speaker, the speaker could come up to the lectern and maybe Didi and I can go up the wings with the microphones. No, no, but whoever's here, they can ask questions. So we've got Jaron, we've got Rodrigo, we've got Karen, we have Paul. <laughs> So we've got a few. So if anyone's got any question, I will pass you a microphone and maybe the guys can stay up there while the question has been asked. You got a question? Okay, bear with me. Uh, yes, uh, I choose, I think, uh, for, for Jerome. Jerome. Yes, uh, <laughs> um, okay. Do you know um, with all of your knowledge and all of your research, uh, do you know if anybody has ever tried to uh, contact uh, the, the organization who is responsible for the Antarctic Treaty to ask them why is it uh, prohibited to travel to Antarctica? Because it's not clear really why they uh, put a, a travel ban there. Uh, yeah, I don't, you know, they don't, it's not, not necessarily a travel ban. I mean, they just make it very, very difficult. Um, you know, you can go there if you wanted, but uh, I don't think anybody would shoot you out of the water, you know. But you can't take any extra fuel if you go down below 60 degrees. Uh, that's just completely ridiculous um, because if you're going to go down and travel for any period of time, you need extra fuel, right? Obviously, uh, a full tank for a boat would barely get you from say South America to the tip right there of that little fish tail that comes out from Antarctica. So um, I don't think it's so much uh, who would you contact, you know, it's a, it's a multi-country Yeah, but if it's document. in New York, in New York you have the UN and it is, it is an existing organization. You check on Google, it, is, right. it, it really exists. So maybe uh, they have some people, a spokesperson or whatever, uh, maybe they could answer a simple question, why is it not allowed? Why all the countries sign up to the same agreement? Right. And See, they would they would tell you that it is allowed. You know, I mean, if 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 I if I went to the UN and said, "Hey, how come I can't go to Antarctica?" They would say, "You're allowed to go. You just need to fill out this packet of paper. You need to get permission from this person. You need to get permission from this country." So they have a way of getting around it. Now, really, that stuff's not realistic. I'm not going to be able to fill out that paperwork. I don't have the scientific credentials to to go down there. So effectively. It is a treaty that prevents us from going there, but not, not honestly. I mean, they're not going to come out and say that. They're not going to say, oh, you're not allowed to go there. They're going to say, no, it is possible. You can go there. But here's what you need to do. Now, the question is, could we ever get something together to actually go down there and do that? 
I think you're talking multiple millions of dollars. Even to get a small vessel to go down there, first of all, how are you gonna get, you're not going to get permission to put extra fuel on. So what are we going to go down there and do? You can't pick up food along the way. So you'd have to have all your preparations for food, for water, for gear. I don't know who's, who's, whose presentation was it you, Paul, that was talking about you can't even have, um, or was it yours, that you can't have like a motorized craft. Yours, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you can go there, but you're not going to be able to do anything when you're there. So I think the questions need to be more about why can't we take motorized craft? They're going to tell you because it pollutes the, the area. So see what I'm saying, how there's a way out for them in every way you try and go after it? If you say, well, you know, why can't we bring a, a skidoo on there or a uh, um, some sort of, I don't know what it would be, some sort of tractor or something, they're going to tell you that it pollutes the air so that you're not allowed to do that. But they're allowed to. They, they can do all that stuff. But it, it, I think it's not right when I hear some people say, oh, the, the treaty says we can't go there. Um, in, a, in effect, the, the words of the treaty will lead you to understand you can't go there. But it's not, it's not written in a way that says you can't go there. Well, then we could just go ask, how come we're not allowed to go there? So instead, the treaty's written in a way that makes it impossible for you to go. So I, I don't know how you ask that question. They, they've effectively blocked it. I don't know how you ask the question, well, why? Because they'll tell you, oh, you can do it. Get permission from this school, this university, this scientific agency. Talk to the NSF. We don't have anything like that. The people who do are, have grants, have, you know, are with a college. They can uh, get three or four or five teachers together and send them to a place that they call, you know, Antarctica, or we don't know where it's at, some base, McMurdo, something like that. And they do science. So uh, it's a good question. I just don't think that um, that would really work. You know, I don't know. Thanks, Anybody, Jeremy. Do you have anybody have a better answer for that one? Paul, somebody? Just add one thing that I've that I've read, and um, just based on reading the treaty itself, it's required that you have an environmental impact study um, completed, um, and that those can be very very expensive. I've heard, and again, I haven't verified this myself, but you have to um, when you go to get permission and fill out the paperwork, you have to have this study done first to. Exp to um, you're describing what you're going to be doing, what the scientific value is, what the in, uh, impact to the environment is. You have to have a third party come and provide that study for you, and then that goes to your packet when you're paying and and, and be doing all your planning and all that. So it, it is, like Jaron said, it's not a situation where you can't go. When you start looking at the steps that it takes, most people are going to go, I can't do it. It's it's not not too feasible for me. I got too much going on, and so I think that's the point of it. It's that you look at it and go. It's going to be too difficult. That's the only thing I would add. Thank you. Packages, I guess, just to some ceremonial areas. You know, they take leaders there and they say that they're there. They go to. They have a ceremonial in North Pole. So, I guess some people can get there without having all the scientific uh, credentials, or I mean, a whole study to stay there for a long time. But they're just going to be there, I guess, just short period and be completely controlled, and you don't know exactly what's your latitude. If you, is that correct to say that some, some people get there through this kind of other route? Just, just what I read online. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, there's been a lot of world leaders that have gone there at very suspicious times, but again, we're just speculating. You know, we're just, we're just speculating. But I know it's very, very difficult. You know, I, I want to know what's going on with the North Pole, too, as well. You know, I know that there's, uh, there's supposedly cruises there, just like the South Pole. And Jaron, you did a good video on uh, researching the cruises that go down to the uh, Antarctic region and how they were all connected. And, you know, when you started calling and, you know, looking at buying tickets and, and the plan, and there was a lot of suspicious things. So at the end of the day, it's, you know, whatever we can find online. So it, it's just very suspicious. No, I was just saying Ben from Taboo Conspiracy has a great video called Antarctica is now closed, I think, or something to that effect. Sorry, we're closed. Yeah, so check out that one because he goes through and looks at all the things that are required, and, and Paul's exactly right. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar thing even to get a, a, an EPA study of what, what kind of damage you'd be doing according to them, uh, to the environment, and it has to be a third party. Uh, I just think there would be so much red tape. I'm not sure we could ever get that. Thanks, John. Um, if we can possibly just have uh, one more question, if anyone's got anything, because... 
Uh, uh, Lisa has actually wanted to do a five minute poem, but is there anything else that anyone wants to add? Do we have a next year? No. <laughs> We're happy to follow your lead. <laughs> uh, at this moment, we haven't got any plans, um, but we are, you can never say never. Uh, but anyway, I just believe there's somebody up here who wants to have a word, so. Uh, no. Wow, okay, he's good. <laughs> um, I, have, I have a question for everybody. By a show of hands, who believes that the earth could be flat with a dome? We mm. don't believe. The word believe. Um, no, believe. I kind of, yeah. Hold your hand up high. Yeah, I think so. Believe it could be. All right, now put your hands down. Now, how many of you know for a fact that it has a dome over it? How many of you? No. Okay, my my pressurized system. For a fact, I'm just asking for a fact. fact. You know, because there's a big difference, difference between believing and knowing for no, a fact. Not believe. It's, it's, there's a lot of evidence that points to it. Yeah, there is no, my 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 there question is, no is very specific. Okay. My question is specific. Okay? I don't think anybody's going to say. Nobody's going to say they know for a no, fact. No. So no. what I'm saying to you is, and this is based on what he said about. Yeah, going to the edge and seeing the dome with your own eyes. Is that what you is that what you really need? Do you really, do you really need to go see it with your own eyes? <laughs> For confirmation. There's so For much fact, evidence yeah. that it is. You know, I mean now now you know what the word freedom is. It's it's not knowing about the dome. That's what freedom is, really is all about. So do you really want to go down that road and find out for a fact like I do? Because I went down that road, I went really oh, much further than the flat earth, okay? And once you get to that point, where do you go from there in knowing? That's my question. Mm. That's a good question. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, I'm now going to pass over to Lisa. I'm sorry there's no more time, but we didn't actually have this plan to do questions, and we didn't actually have a plan to do the poem either. But anyway, over to you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. I wanted to share this poem in my book called The Lie of the Century. Um, the moon landing hoax and not breaking news. It's all part of the plan, folks. So let us take a review. If it's not just a show and they're not telling porkies, then why are there shadows from various sources? Who took the first photo of Apollo 11? From the face of the moon? Use your own discretion. And why was there no dust on the landing pads? according to your trustful understanding, lads. Question the reflection on the astronaut's visor. Then under inspection, Armstrong is a liar. He was interviewed once on man's greatest achievement, along with the rest of the panel, all three gents. He looked to the right to, re to recall a description, but his words weren't airtight as they point to a fiction. If you look to the left, you're recalling a memory which really suggests it's the light of the century. The trio have been fooling the world for their club, hence traumatised Aubrey put in faces at Trump. Once again, Armstrong couldn't swear on the Bible that he went to the moon, many life for survival. Aubrey, however, upon investigation, slung a right-hander when quizzed, no hesitation. So why have experiments in a vacuum chamber? put the darn astronauts in serious danger. Millionaire's moon rock has been proved to be fake. We've been taken for fools, there is little mistake. And of course, sound don't carry in no atmosphere zones. Hence, spacemen hammering, heard in low tones. We must bow to these prodigies for their acclaimed milestone, achieved using technology less than a mobile phone. Then you have to wonder why they never returned and how the unfortunate blunder occurred. You know, the lost files for rocket construction, for the 200 odd mile trip and all the instructions. Must be a challenger to do it again. With a budget of 19 odd billion, poor men. We must also address the Van Allen dilemma. As Kelly Smith stresses, it's a grande problema. It poses as a danger, low earth orbits our limit, didn't stop the moon crew though, did it? Mr. Don Petit and his joker companion could see stars from space and they said it with passion. That's funny, because Armstrong saw no, saw no stars at all. This farce is far gone and we've heard enough ball. 
And so we can see under closer inspection on mass inconsistencies in every direction. They're seething with lies, nothing more than mere showmen. One giant lie for mankind should be their slogan. But it does make you wonder how on earth we still marvel at the iconic picture, aka the blue marble. When rockets take off at, into space at odd angles, why do we trust them when the whole thing's a scandal? I'll leave it to you guys to work out the rest. Until the next time, over and out. Peace, man. Bless. In closing, I'd just like to say a couple of things. One, thank you very much for being here. Everyone on live stream has actually been filming it or actually been um, responding uh, on the internet, which I haven't seen, I've got to be honest. Um, sorry once again to the speakers that we had to cut short. That was really bad, but because we had to go from a, a weekend to just a Saturday, I apologize. And the final point I want to leave is instead of the term living the dream, I think that we've over the years been sold lying the dream. So anyway, thank you very much.